Welcome to Cultivating Curiosity, where we get down and dirty with the experts on all the ways science and agriculture touch our lives, from what we eat to how we live. I'm Emily Davenport. And I'm Jordan Powers. And we're from the University of Georgia's College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. While most episodes of Cultivating Curiosity are recorded in our Athens, Georgia studio, a lot of the amazing work that happens at CAES and UGA Extension occurs across the state. Today, we are at the UGA Griffin campus, about 30 miles south of Atlanta, with Kevin Misaval, Associate Professor in the Department of Food Science and Technology. Kevin, thanks for having us out to Griffin today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. We are really excited to dive into this conversation. And spoiler, I think Emily is extra excited on yes, some of is. the topics we'll cover today. <laughs> Before we dive into his background, we got to peek into Kevin's lab in Griffin, where he had built an entire miniaturized version of a peach processing line, where peaches are washed and packed before distribution. This project is funded by the Georgia Department of Agriculture and is investigating ways to improve on the washing and packing process in order to minimize bacteria before the peaches make their way to suppliers nationwide. So the equipment that we're looking uh, directly at is our simulated packing, uh, washing and, and packing equipment for peaches. Turns out that there is a, an issue with cleaning some of the rollers that are in this type of equipment. So what we're trying to do is to explore better ways to clean these rollers using technologies that we are developing in my lab. And so with those designs, we are going to be able to clean and disinfect these commonly used rollers more effectively. And so the intention of building this pilot plant uh, line is to mimic the conditions that uh, you would see in, in real packing um, operations of fruits and vegetables. So uh, as a process engineer, I like to build things, I like to study things, I like to understand how things work and how do we make things better for the food industry in general. Absolutely, and some of that research is happening behind a computer, but some of it's happening by building a processing line. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's how you understand and how you teach your students as well to understand the processes that you wanted to improve. We took some photos of the mini processing line that we'll share in the show notes. In the meantime, let's get back to the interview. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in food science? Born and raised in Guatemala, Central America. Growing up um, in a developing country, I was fascinated with you know some of the technologies that I saw uh, do during my especially high school years. I uh, was so uh, fascinated with the way sugar cane uh, is made. So Guatemala is one of the largest uh, sugar cane producers in the world. So uh, when I went to high school there, I had the opportunity to intern uh, at the largest sugar cane mill in Guatemala, mm -hmm. where I was fascinated about you know all these pieces of equipment, large pieces of equipment that were used uh, to make a sugar cane. And that's how I was really interested in, in learning more about food processing as an area study. Uh, I, was, I wanted to become um, you know, a process engineer. Um, the only way you, you could have done it back uh, 20, 25 years ago in Guatemala was to become a chemical engineer. I didn't want to study chemical engineering per se. I wanted to study something more related closer to foods, to food processing. So it turns out that in Guatemala at the time, there were not really any food science, food processing schools. So I was looking at a way to pursue a bachelor's degree in food, food science, food engineering outside Guatemala. So I had the opportunity to go to Honduras and study food science and technology in Honduras, where I met uh, incredible people from all over Latin America. So the place that I went was called Samorano University. During those years, I learned about not only the different cultures about Latin America, from Latin America, um, from Mexico all over to Chile. And uh, I had incredible mentors, incredible professors who had PhDs in food processing, any area, possible area in, in agriculture right away. So when I was a senior in, in Samarano in Honduras, I had the opportunity to come to the to Louisiana State University as an intern for four months. So I came and I interned uh, in Dr. Subramanian Satibel's lab. Uh, we conducted a project with uh, transforming catfish oil into biodiesel. So it was really interesting, wow. you know, that was a very interesting project and I was really fascinated by it. 
you know, when I, I was young and, and dumb, probably, and, you know, I wasn't really <laughs> interested too much in science. By the way, I never, ever thought about going to become a professor, you know, ever. All that I wanted to do, you know, get a college degree, back in Guatemala, of course, you know, get a college degree, get a job, and maybe start a family, and I, I, I probably didn't have, like, a uh, big dreams. All that I wanted to do is like work hard, focus on, on my work one day at a time. So um, I, when I came to LSU for that internship, my major professor at the time offered me to return as a master's student. One of the limitations that I had at the time was that my uh, English was not good, uh, so I had to improve it a lot. So I wanted to come back to the United States and get a degree. My goal was to return one day to Latin America, work in Guatemala or any country in Central America. That, that's all that I wanted to do. Anyways, I, I came back to LSU for uh, my master's in food science and technology, which I completed uh, in 2011. So then after that, again, my major professor asked me to stay for PhD program, but this time in, in biological engineering. I had to think about a little bit whether I wanted to pursue that because that was going to be like four more years study. And so in a major that I wasn't completely familiar with, I had to take a lot of courses in engineering and do more challenging studies but I was having a good time in at LSU and in school you know, I had a lot of friends and we were doing great job interesting research and I decided to continue in that path so four years later I completed my PhD in biological engineering I didn't know what to do actually I was more maybe inclined to join industry but at the same time I, I had a something inside of me that I wanted to mentor uh, young people and we, I, I had extensively published a lot of scientific articles regarding regarding process optimizations, food processing operations, developing a high value food ingredient. I talked to my, my major advisor and he recommended me maybe to improve my teaching skills because in grad school I never had the opportunity to teach a complete course. So I took a, a teaching job at the University of Holy Cross in, in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, where I taught uh, food processing, uh, physics and advanced physics courses for undergrads. Uh, and I definitely love that job. I mean, definitely like it. You know, I enjoy working with young people we were like experimenting, brainstorming all the time. And after two years, I felt that I wanted to include a, a research component in my career. So I was looking for you know positions in both academia and in industry. So I, academic uh, jobs, in, in especially faculty jobs, take a lot longer. The interview process it's um, about a year or so. But industry, the hiring process is a lot faster. I got a job at a nanotechnology company in Dayton, Ohio, where I was a process engineer. Uh, and I was um, in charge of managing the spray drying operations for the company. We're doing a lot of nano-sized products for energy storage applications. So it was a fascinating job. I mean, I, I definitely learned more about material science. I only work with material scientists and material engineers. And it turns out that the technology that I was in charge of, which by the way, is my area of expertise, spray drying, uh, nobody in the material world uh, knows too much about it. I mean, it's a technology that is widely known in food and pharmaceutical industries but it's being introduced now to other fields because you know uh, it's versatility and cost effectiveness so I was in charge of a big group of engineers we're doing all kinds of products production and research and I really like that job unfortunately I wasn't working with foods and most of the work that I was doing, I wasn't really doing too much work outside that particular technology, which in, in a way I enjoyed because it definitely allowed me to go a lot deeper in understanding the technology, and especially uh, large scales. We're doing a lot of production scales. So when my current position uh, was advertised, I got a call from my major professor I'm back from LSU, right? And he said, hey, Kevin, you should apply to this position. You're a perfect candidate for it. And I wasn't really convinced because I know University of Georgia has a great great reputation, especially in the food science and technology field. And I was like, there is no way I'm gonna get that job, but I'll, I'll do my best and I will interview. I will apply. You never know about these positions, right? So I remember it was uh, February, 2018. And a month later, the chair of food science and technology actually called me, uh, Dr. Rakesh Singh, and offered me the position. And I was definitely, you know, surprised. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Fast forward, I joined the program in uh, the fall of 2000. 
2018, I've been here in the program on the Griffin campus for five years now. I don't remember having a better time in my life than I'm having it today. It's a great opportunity. I'm so blessed. I'm so grateful to have this position. So that's how I get here, you know. <laughs> and, and on top of that, we heard that just three weeks ago, you said you received a promotion to associate professor. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, what an exciting journey. And it's great to have people looking out for you to hook you up with a position like, well, at least put the position in your uh, line of sight to have your professor. Sure, say, yeah. Say, that mentor sounds like a solid mentor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah, it is. It is definitely. That's definitely. awesome. We know that you have an 80% research, 20% UGA extension appointment. So what does a day-to-day look like for you? Having a lot of research appointment uh, requires me to spend a lot of time doing research. That means uh, reading articles, brainstorming. Unfortunately, I don't work too much in the lab doing the, the experimental analysis and all of that. I did that during the first couple of years uh, that I got here. But I spent that time to train my students, train my technicians, my senior scientists, so they can do it now for me. So they understand every time that I instruct them what I want them to do, uh, they will do it. So now my day looks like more towards reading research articles, writing a lot. So I would say 90% of my day is writing. It's writing, reading, and reading, understanding what is the current research in food science. How is, does it look like? How do how do we implement the new knowledge into our research so we can expand the scientific knowledge in our field? So uh, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort because what happens most of the time is I get easily distracted by many things, many ideas. We may have like ten good ideas, excellent ideas, but then uh, we had to make a, a choice about selecting the best the best one not even the best two the best one so your chances of getting funded uh, and publishing the work are higher if you focus on maybe one or two ideas so that's how my day looks like doing a lot of research I'm mentoring students uh, which I enjoy a lot, working with young people. Sometimes they have a background in food processing, food science. Uh, most of the time it's very limited. So it's my job to actually train them. And that takes time as well. That takes time, takes effort from, from both sides. And I'm very happy and glad to have had good grad students. Kevin does a great job mentoring his students. His doctoral student, Peter Chiarelli, just received a pre-doctoral fellowship from USDA NEFA for his research. We'll add a link to the story in the show notes for you to learn more. By the way, USDA NEFA is the United States Department of Agriculture's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. They provide leadership and funding for programs that advance agriculture-related sciences. We'll link their website in the show notes, too. Like I said, most of my oh, my time is dedicated to doing research and doing a lot of experimental work, uh, planning, brainstorming, and um, publishing that work. In my case, it doesn't really matter how much work we do in the lab unless we publish it, right? So we'll publish it in, in top journals because we want to improve the, the recognition of our department in, in the scientific field. So that's part of my job. Uh, make sure that the work that we do here is high quality, is impactful, and expands this, the current scientific knowledge. By doing that, i um, also dedicated to train students, like I said before, not only students, uh, but also visiting scientists, uh, technicians, and my whole team. I collaborate with other faculty members here in, in our program and, and also in other programs across the United States. And now I'm starting to collaborate with more people outside the U.S., like people from Thailand, researchers from Brazil. And I think that's the second phase now of my career here at UGA. Absolutely, keeping that impact right here on the Griffin campus, but then also taking it across the globe, which is really exciting. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, absolutely. I do have an extension appointment as well. I teach some uh, workshops and uh, also in our department, like the Better Process Control School. But I, I also work uh, with food companies, train food personnel uh, in the U.S. and also uh, overseas. For example, I, I went to my home country uh, last year to in, in a U.S. aid uh, mm-hmm. funded project and so I help a local company in Guatemala developing food products that are actually being commercialized as we speak. It was a fascinating experience and sometimes these companies back in developing countries don't have the resources or the knowledge um, to develop good foods that are healthy, nutritious and of course safe. 
those are like the tricky areas that I like to address every time that I, I'm, I'm assisting or helping a food company developing a new product. When Kevin references USAID, he's talking about USAID, which is the United States Agency for International Development. We'll add a link in the show notes for you. Uh, more recently, again in my uh, extension work, I went to Uzbekistan to assist the company optimizing food processing operations. So the company is one of the largest exporters of fruits and vegetables in, in Uzbekistan. They had issues with uh, process optimization. So I went there, you know, train some of their personnel to look after how to improve operations. Uh, what are the key areas of looking at fresh fruits and vegetables? How do can, they can you know improve those operations by using uh, some of the technologies I'm using here in, in the United States? So that was a great, great experience. Again, that's another project with uh, USAID funded program. I'm happy that my impact has been recognized not only in the US but now outside the United States. A lot of that impact, like you mentioned, you, you share in those journal articles, which is something fantastic. And I know your faculty profile has quite a few of those listed, so we will be sure to link that in the show notes if people really want to dive in and learn more about the research that you're completing. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned your students and your grad students. What are some of the projects that they're currently working on, or is there, are there some that you can share with us? Well, we have a, a bunch of different projects, and that's one of the beauties of being in academic work, right? So we can develop our own ideas, but at the same time, we have I have diversified a lot of my research, which at some point I'll try to cut some of the work that we're currently doing. But when I joined UGA five years ago, we started working with a project with uh, Georgia-grown uh, pomegranates. Most of these pomegranates are sold in the fresh market, right? So we saw an opportunity to uh, develop high-value food ingredients and see how we can help the industry to diversify a little bit and also understand how they can uh, utilize byproducts, meaning peels and seeds. We look at the antioxidants of their phytochemicals in pomegranates and we were fascinated to find that pomegranates and pomegranate peels are incredible sources of antioxidants that may have some health benefits. One of the projects that we conducted was to extract uh, pectin from pomegranate peels and uh, extract also the antioxidants from those peels and also from the juice and to encapsulate that and produce a powder product that could have both pectins and antioxidants. That's a high value product. We conducted the feasibility studies and most of this work is published in scientific journals. As part of this project as well, I collaborated with Dr. Jean Ruchen, who was the main, the main PI for the project. So she was looking at food safety aspects of these compounds and it turns out that some of these compounds have a strong antimicrobial properties. It was fascinating. So, you know, that's something that we didn't know before. That's how we started helping local growers in Georgia with this new project. So on another project that we're currently working on is with satsumas, satsuma mandarins. It's an emerging crop here in Georgia. And one of the challenges for the satsuma industry is that there is a lot of satsuma trees that have been planted recently and the harvesting window is very short. So most of that harvest is intended for the fresh market. And it's expected that all that Satsuma Mandarin production is gonna saturate the market in the coming years. And now we're exploring alternatives to utilize the excess fruit or the second grade fruit. So we're looking at producing Satsuma juice powders used in spray drying. And we have found that Satsuma juice powders are a great, great source of vitamin C. The advantage of having those products is that those products are shelf stable and also can be utilized in different food applications, but not only food applications, but also in cosmetics, in other applications where a natural ingredient is required. So we're excited about that uh, because it's Georgia grown, it's a natural product, and may have a lot of potential in the coming years. A lot of the work that we doing in my lab is uh, feasibility studies. One of the main questions is, can we make this? Can we make that? So we start with that question, right? I prefer focusing on uh, Georgia grown commodities, pomegranate and Satsuma mandarins. And obviously we have had some success and especially with one of the commodities that very few people have heard of, which is jellyfish. And I've been so fortunate to have a lot of success on that project. But like I said before, and I think I'm gonna explain a little bit more about what we're doing with, with jellyfish, but a lot of the work that we do again is to do uh, feasibility studies and also identify economic opportunities for our growers here. 
So things that they never thought of in like Satsuma use powders, how they can make a profit producing those type of products. They already have the fruit, they already have the raw materials, but they may not have the knowledge of how to make, you know, to get through that process of developing this new product. Uh, at the University of Georgia uh, Griffin Campus, we have great resources. We also have the Food Product Innovation Center. I work with them a lot in developing, commercializing some of these ideas that we originally started in my lab. What, and and we'll definitely talk about Food Pick later because that, that mm-hmm. could be a whole episode on its own. Yep. I'm just stuck on what an amazing opportunity both for your students to have the experience of, of checking the feasibility of products that they will eventually see. What an amazing mm-hmm. opportunity for the producers who are finding a whole new revenue stream in their production. And then the end consumer who at the end of the day is benefiting from these products. I mean, it is impactful on so many different levels kind of throughout this process from that first question of can we do this to seeing a vitamin C supplement on a shelf. That's mm-hmm. that's pretty powerful. Yeah, I think it's really cool. The creativity that goes into thinking about what else can we do with this besides just consuming a raw fruit product or something like that. Um, and I love the creativity of the jellyfish and that is not something that we think of as a food item at all so can you tell us more about your work with the jellyfish and your success there wow yeah (laughs) i think that uh uh, by far one of the you know most successful projects that we currently have in my program. Uh, well, I think it uh, we started working with jellyfish by strike of luck, I would say. Back at LSU, I work a lot with seafood byproducts in how to develop high value products from using or utilizing seafood byproducts. So I work with catfish, catfish skin, catfish oil. I work with crawfish, crawfish byproducts. Um, I work with shrimp, oysters. Uh, Louisiana has a rich history of seafood processing and seafood innovation. So when I came to the University of Georgia, I joined the program in the first month into the job, I got a call from Tori Stivers, who is the seafood specialist uh, for uh, Georgia Sea Grant and Marine Extension. And she called me, she said, hey Kevin, I saw an email of you hiring and I saw that you graduated from LSU and I know the LSU has a strong seafood technology program. And by the way, are you familiar with jellyfish and any potential uses for a jellyfish? And I was like, what? Jellyfish? <laughs> <laughs> I, I never heard about jellyfish in my life. And can you explain a little bit more about that? So she was kind enough uh, to meet me, and it uh, turns out that it, at the time, uh, the Georgia jellyfish industry uh, was struggling, and I didn't know there was a, actually a, a Georgia jellyfish industry. <laughs> um, so the Georgia jellyfish industry, it turns out that you know they catch jellyfish uh, spring, spring months of the year, and salt it, dry it, and then export it to Asian countries. Now, that's a, a technology that is very, very old, uh, salty drying jellyfish. Uh, it's been used for centuries, and, and there is nothing new there. The challenge that the industry has, or had at the time, is, la, is that, you know, one of the main buyers of salty dry jellyfish is, uh, was China. So China was imposing a lot of import taxes on these salty dry jellyfish from the United States. So they wanted to introduce uh, jellyfish products into the local market, meaning United States, right? But the challenge is how do we convince domestic consumers to eat salted dry jellyfish? And so that's where I came in with ideas about commercializing, you know, jellyfish-based products. And I said, well, it seems like jellyfish is a great commodity and has a great potential. And I, I told uh, Tori divers hey, to, you know, send me some samples. I'll look at it in my lab, explore what it has, uh, what we can do. True enough, they, they were kind enough to send me samples of jellyfish. So we're looking at different aspects of the nutritional profile. And we found that cannibal jellyfish or jelly balls are a great source of collagen. The cannibal jellyfish is a harmless, dare we say cute, round jellyfish that's also known as a jelly ball. The species is Stomolophus meliagris. We'll add a link in the show notes where you can learn more about these rotund jellies.
When we discovered that, it was like an aha moment for me. I'm like, wow, this is collagen. And I knew about the new collagen trends that are happening now in the market. And then I said, well, you know, uh, this, this could be definitely a really good cool raw material for making collagen-based products. And they were a little bit skeptical, you know, there's some people, no, oh, we wanted to do, you know, you probably just freeze jellyfish and have frozen jellyfish and sell it to the market. Although that's a great idea, the challenge with that is we still need to convince the domestic consumers to eat that jellyfish, to buy that jellyfish, right? So a lot of people are still skeptical about eating uh, jellyfish, but we also found that when you provide a powder product to a consumer, that consumer is more willing to try that new product compared to if you give the whole piece of that commodity or that product to the consumer. That's how everything started. We started working on that project, discovered the collagen in jellyfish, apply for funding, because that's another thing that I do. A lot of the work that we currently do, uh, we need to find sponsors from the federal government, state government, or industry to pay for that project because you know research is expensive and so we had to you know apply for some funding and at the beginning it was really really challenging because you know a lot of the people the agencies are skeptical about jellyfish they don't think it's it's a thing here in georgia but georgia has an advantage over other states because here in georgia jellyfish is a state fishery so meaning you know it's legal to harvest and it's legal to commercialize and process jellyfish so we started working with this and you know apply for funding. We're really blessed to receive funding from the uh, United States Department of Agriculture through its NIFA uh, program. That's where everything really started to exponentially grow, I, I would say. You know, we, we had more resources to do research and understand more about the jellyfish collagen and how we could create products that will have thickening properties. A lot of the collagen based ingredients that you see in the food industry are used to provide thickness. Um, that is not always the case. In some applications, thickness is not required. So we were like working on understanding at what point this collagen uh, will provide thickness and what conditions this collagen will not provide thickness. And so we are currently looking at ways to produce collagen peptides as well. I don't know have you hear you know some of the collagen peptide supplements keep in hearing the it in, in headlines yeah. and <laughs> yep. all the trending uh-huh. articles. Yes. Yep. <laughs> most of those collagen peptide supplements are coming from mammalian collagen meaning bovine and porcine sources now we're trying to introduce a new collagen source which is jellyfish and the advantages that we have with jellyfish is that jellyfish is one of the few uh, marine species whose biomass is going to increase exponentially in the next few years and arguably is due to global warming unfortunately uh, oceans are getting warmer are getting more acidic and that's just killing a lot of the jellyfish predators across the globe not only here in, in coastal Georgia uh, there is uh, it's been reported that more jellyfish blooms have been spotted meaning all the biomass of jellyfish uh, is increasing the question is, what are we going to do with that excess biomass of jellyfish? Are we going to do any anything or are we just going to, you know, it, you know, rotting in our beaches? And speaking of that, if you go to Savannah, uh, January, February, you will see a lot of jellyfish uh, wash off, the, you know, on, on the beaches. In that area, you, you will be amazed seeing how much jellyfish biomass is there. So definitely there is a there is good supply of jellyfish. When we started working with this project several years ago, we spoke with several companies interested in commercializing all these technologies. One of the questions that uh, we are asked all the time is how much jellyfish is, is in the ocean, right? Obviously, that's not my area of expertise, um, nor am I a marine biologist, but we were really curious about, you know, how much jellyfish is in the ocean. So what I did, we were looking for other jellyfish fisheries in, in North America, and it turns out we found that there is a, a jellyfish fishery in Mexico. Gulf of Santa Clara has the largest jellyfish fishery in the United States. Oh. 
So we were lucky enough, you know, to make contact with them and they invited us for uh, their harvest in 2022 last year. So I took my PhD student who is, you know, uh, leading the, the project and in charge of, of the project. So we went there uh, to the Gulf of Santa Clara in Mexico. Uh, I was fascinated because that uh, fisherman town is in the middle of a desert. It was an incredible, incredible experience. And we were fascinated about the amount of jellyfish we saw there. Last year, they processed 500,000 tons wow. of jellyfish. It's a <laughs> one town operation. Wow. So, and, and they say they're seeing more jellyfish, you know, every year. We suspect that probably same quantities are gonna be found here in Georgia. It's the same species, same type of jellyfish, uh, with you know great potential for becoming a really good raw material for collagen-based products. Now we're looking at you know studying, understanding more about the technical aspects of these products. You know we filed for a patent a couple of years ago with the uh, University of Georgia Innovation Gateway. So we're expecting that, and of course, as a researcher, uh, um, we're publishing the data in the scientific journals. Uh, we want to share the knowledge as well uh, with the world, because jellyfish is one of the few marine species who more people are experimenting with across the globe, not only in the United States, but also in, in Europe and Asia. Uh, they are recognizing the potential economic uh, opportunities that may come with these marine species. That's kind of, you know, where we are right now. I, my PhD student, uh, Peter Chiarelli, who is leading the project, uh, received a, a USDA pre-doctoral, a NIFA pre-doctoral fellowship uh, to work wow. on jellyfish. Uh, and, uh, and that fellowship is a prestigious one, one of the most prestigious awards that a, a, a PhD student in food science can receive. So I'm so glad, you know, so thankful for that and all the support. Uh, that we have received from federal government, state government, and uh, also industry, and of course, uh, University of Georgia. How exciting, both for the program and for this PhD student who really gets to kind of spearhead this project and make it happen. And we know we've covered over the years several articles on the Jellyfish Project, so we'll make sure to link those in the show notes for our listeners so that they can learn a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So one of the techniques or processes that you've mentioned several times now is spray drying. We got a little bit of an inside scoop because last time we were in Griffin, we got to tour Food Pick and see kind of the spray drying technology in action. But for our listeners who might not be familiar, can you explain a little bit more about what spray drying is? Spray drying is a technology that was introduced more than a century ago uh, by the dairy industry. Oh, they had a, a challenge on making you know, shelf stable milk. They were producing a lot of milk, but they didn't realize that they didn't have enough capacity to, you know, refrigerate all that milk. So they came up with an idea of using hot air to dehydrate, you know, milk. So spray drying is a technology that uses most of the time hot air, and that hot air will get in contact with spray product. You know, you see these small droplets getting in contact with hot air and that uh, instantly will dehydrate the product. And so you can collect powders. So it's a technology to produce powders because its versatility, its effectiveness and cost effectiveness, most importantly, uh, it's, uh, it's widely used not only in the food industry, but also in pharmaceutical industries uh, and also um, chemical industry and now by the material industry as well. So you can have, you know, uh, food powders shelf stable or with low moisture content uh, these powders will last years and that's why it is a technology that is widely adopted by different industries that's really cool yeah right. i remember it looked like it was snowing the time when you yes, see it because yes. it, I, th- I think it was a milk product mm-hmm. and i'm like oh it just looks like a little chamber of snow right. <laughs> <laughs> just making some snow <laughs> hot snow <laughs> When talking about innovation, right, of food products, um, you mentioned the UGA Food Process Innovation and Commercialization Center earlier, or Food Pick as we commonly call it, because that's a mouthful that I can't believe I got through on one day. Yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> I was like, wait, is, what is that place you're talking about? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, the Food Pick. <laughs> Can you tell us more about Food Pick and how you partner with Georgia food businesses specifically? You know, when I was hired uh, five years ago, um, Part of my job was to work with Food Peak. At the time, I worked with uh, Dr. Kirk Kelly, who was the um, Food Peak director. 
So we conducted uh, different projects. Uh, one of them was pomegranate project that I previously uh, explained. And I also was helping uh, Dr. Kili's team to work with some companies and develop either new food processing operations or you know implementing uh, or optimizing food processing operations for specific clients. Foodpick has clients, uh, domestic clients that at the time they, they needed optimization of spread line operations. So that's you know some of the work I help with. In other areas, I, I also help with you know product development uh, approach. So we had um, a project with a company that was trying to develop products from corn processing waste streams. So we're looking at the waste streams and trying to develop pre-dried uh, food ingredients from those waste streams. That's kind of you know the work that we have done with Food Peak, and I uh, serve as the interim director of Food Peak uh, in 2021 to 2022. Uh, we work with other companies and help companies to develop uh, products and also conduct shelf life studies, among other things. So Foodpeak is, is always busy. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, and especially that work with the industry byproducts that you've just talked about with Foodpick and then previously with, with some of the other projects you've worked on. What an amazing way to promote sustainability, to reduce food waste. Mm-hmm. You know, again, we talked about kind of the trifecta of people that are benefiting from these research products. But at the end of the day, I mean, the environment is benefiting as mm-hmm. well, which is really exciting. Yeah, it's really great. And getting creative with Georgia food commodities too, which is also great to stick close to home. Can you tell us more about what smart food processing is and how you use it in your research? Right, Um, thank you for asking that question. Having worked in industry in another, uh, in a completely different industry to the food industry, I I saw a lot of the really nice technologies that other industries are using to improve processes. You know, really nice gadgets, state of the art technologies. And I was fascinated by it. And you know, and at the time, uh, of course, obviously my hands were tied. I couldn't really explore those technologies because I had one job and I was running the spray dryers and leading that team and then and, and being in now in an academic environment where I have the opportunity to explore those ideas, explore, you know, how do we improve uh, current food processing operations using modern technologies. And unfortunately, you know, food industry has lagged into adopting modern, you know, technologies that are being very effective in other industries. And some of those technologies are like, you know, our thermal imaging, for example. Uh, that's a specific example that I can share with you. Thermal imaging technologies are kind of, you know, well studied in other fields, but not really in the food processing environment. Part of the work that we are doing is using thermal cameras to get thermal images of food processing operations. So we can see a different uh, physical phenomena, especially uh, heat transfer, uh, energy, energy transfer phenomena um, with these cameras. It turns out that some of these devices, uh, they used to be extremely expensive 10, 15 years ago. Nowadays, they are like in the hundreds. So we one project that we had funded with the Center for Produce Safety we look at using thermal cameras that can be connected with the smartphones. Those cameras can be easily used and operated by food uh, operators to look at the temperatures of fresh produce. That was a really nice, interesting project. Nobody had thought about it, and we were like evaluating the effectiveness of using those cameras and making recommendations about uh, whether those cameras could collect you know, reliable data that could be compared with uh, regular thermometers or uh, thermocouples or ther- regular temperature recorders. It turns out they are even more effective because you, know, you can collect uh, temperature data in real time and, and with non-contact approaches. So yeah, so and there are other technologies as well, smart technologies that that can be used to improve our food operations. And that's why I think now uh, one of the areas that my group is focusing on is to how do we adopt all these technologies that are out there and implement those technologies for the benefit of the food industry. We've heard you're focusing on developing simulations to optimize food processing conditions. Uh, so our, for our audience who doesn't might not have computer science backgrounds, um, tell us more about what's involved and how often do you get to play with virtual reality? 
<laughs> right, that's a good question. Computer simulations are cool tools, I would say, that I started working with when I was in grad school. Uh, in fact, uh, my PhD thesis was about um, computer simulations of spray drying operations. A lot of the processes that we currently use in the food industry, uh, we don't understand them really well in terms of the physical phenomena that is happening. With computer simulations, you know, these simulations do is they help us to gain a better understanding of the physical phenomena, meaning heat, mass transfer, energy transfer, all these things that physicists and engineers like to you know, study. And the, the main reason for that is because we wanted to gain all that knowledge so we can improve that operation. We can improve not only the operation, but also uh, improve the, the type of products that are being processed with that operation. In the case of spray drying, the work that I did was to understand how this hot air was actually interacting with all these products that were being dried. So by understanding that, we could design better operations so the product, the resultant food powders that came out of the spray dryer were higher quality and more nutritious and of course safe. Um, so that's one of the, the ways you know we use computer simulations. And the ad another advantage of using computer simulations is also that they are more cost effective that conduct compared to conducting experimental work in the field. So with computer simulations, we we you know simulate something that will happen in reality, right? So like we simulate a uh, spray drying operation, for example. So we can simulate different conditions, have different uh, assumptions, and we'll have the specific answers. So that definitely help in or uh, speed up the you know R and D process, uh, and that's definitely beneficial. And speaking of uh, virtual reality, so I started working with virtual reality a couple of years ago um, because we had a problem with showing uh, food peak facilities, actually. So we got clients from all over the, the, you know, the United States wanted to see what kind of equipment we had in food peak and what, how our facilities look like. So we came up with the idea, oh, why don't we 3D scan the, the facilities and we share that scan with our potential clients. And that's where we started working with virtual reality. And we got really excited about the quality of the scans that we could collect and then the type of tools that the clients needed to observe all those you know, 3D scans of these virtual realities. And it turns out that it has a lot of uh, applications to improve uh, food safety operations, food processing operations. Uh, for example, if you are in corporate headquarters, uh, let's say Chicago, and you have facilities in, in Georgia and you want to see how your current facilities look like, uh, you can definitely you know, access some of these 3D models of your facilities and observe how the current status of your facility look like. Uh, we have uh, 3D scan several uh, commercial food processing facilities over the years. That has helped a lot the clients to improve their operations. So we're really fascinated by that. And that's a couple of examples that are how we have used that technology to improve operations. Cool, wow. It is. It's incredible <laughs> to think about, you know, obviously spray drying doesn't look like what it did centuries ago, but it's amazing to talk about a technology that has been around for centuries and then all of this new technology really just coming together. And again, mm -hmm. I still, it just blows my mind that at the end of the day, when you pull that product off the shelf and go to check out at the grocery store, I guarantee you for most people, these are not the thoughts <laughs> that probably go through their heads. Yeah. Grocery shopping must be a lot different for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're buying these products. <laughs> But we have, we've covered so much ground today from some of these new technologies to the age-old technologies to a focus on Georgia commodities that turn around and impact the world. What have we missed? I just want to say I'm so blessed and, and grateful to have the, my current position. Um, like I said before, I don't remember having so much fun, you know, in my job. It's definitely a privilege to have the opportunity to work for University of Georgia as a faculty member with a great, great, great team couldn't have achieved what I have achieved without obviously the support of my family, my mentors, um, my department, uh, I got an incredible department uh, head that is always supportive. He is providing some resources for us to explore in other areas of research. And also the support from our college, uh, College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences in the University of Georgia. And, and of course the, uh, the University of Georgia Griffin campus 
I feel that I'm so blessed, I'm so happy here to spend more time with my students, my staff. It's a privilege to mentor all these you know, young people as well. I definitely enjoy working with them. I'm so happy when they they publish an article or they, they receive an award. And that makes me really happy. That brings me joy, definitely. More than you know, publishing an article, uh, it's uh, the impact that my work is having in other people's lives, especially the young ones. So uh, I'm fully dedicated to train the next generation of food scientists, food innovators. I'm very positive that a lot of my current students, they will join industry, federal or state government, you know, in, in key positions in the next few years. So, and that's the legacy that I want to leave behind. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity that you're providing me, um, the platform to share some of my accomplishments with the general public. And we always open, you know, to conversations and willing to learn more about how we can help. That's that sort of lemma in the lab, how we can help, how we can help our industry, how we can help our community. Always the question that I, I ask myself and my team, how we can help. I can't think of a more perfect or inspirational way to end this conversation. So, yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for inviting us out to the Griffin campus and taking the time today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And Yay. Thanks for listening to Cultivating Curiosity, a podcast produced by the UGA College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. A special thanks to Mason McClintock for our music and sound effects. Find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts.